afternoon. Was this already adjusted for you? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, the Reverend Dr. Martha Moore Kish, who is here to speak to us about what theologian John Calvin referred to as the chief exercise of faith, Christian prayer. Whether you are here today to deepen your prayer life or even just find a starting point for how to think about prayer, we know Dr. Moore Kish will have insight to offer all of us. Dr. Moore Kish has served on the faculty of Columbia Seminary since 2004, and in 2019, she was named the J.B. Green Professor of Theology. Prior to her time at Columbia, she served as an assistant professor of liturgical studies at Yale Divinity School, and prior to that, she was the associate for worship at the PCUSA Office of Theology and Worship in Louisville, Kentucky. Her research interests include Reformed theology, liturgical theology, especially the theology and practice of the sacraments, and feminist theology. She also has interests in ecumenical theology and interfaith, interfaith issues, including Reformed Roman Catholic relations, Christian Jewish relations, and the religions of India. Dr. Moore Kish is married to Chris, who is also a PCUSA minister, and they have two young adult daughters, Miriam and Fiona. Both Nick and Kathy have asked that I express their deep gratitude to Dr. Moore Kish for being with us this weekend. In addition to being their theology professor, both consider Martha a mentor and a friend. Kathy still hopes that one day she will grow up to be like Martha. And Nick would like to publicly apologize for the time he burst into song and interrupted Martha's lecture in her intro to theology class. Dr. Moore Kish. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> all of that is true. Uh, yes. Um, I just have to say I'm delighted to be here. My only sadness is that Nick and Kathy are not here. Um, but uh, I have long admired both of them. And um, Kathy memorably uh, house sat for us uh, the summer that we were away in India, actually, for three months. Um, and uh, she did a remarkable job of taking care of the chickens uh, while we were gone and, and the cats and all the rest of it. So um, I'm delighted to be here with you. I was telling Susan on the way over, this is actually the first time I have spoken to real live three-dimensional people in a church, seriously since March of 2020. So if I get a little weepy, it's because you're not on a screen. <laughs> and I just have to soak this up for just a second. Um, so I'm, I am genuinely delighted to be here. Um, and I am going to be talking uh, about uh, prayer. Um, and I know that some of you have um, taken a look at my little book, uh, Christian Prayer for Today, and if you have read that book, some of what I say today may be familiar to you, uh, because um, I, this is what I think, actually, still, uh, about prayer. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be repeating some things, perhaps, that you've already heard, but um, I hope it can be the beginning of a good conversation. And um, I will, uh, along the way, invite you, if you have things you want to contribute, uh, questions you want to raise, I am always happy for this to be a conversation, so feel free uh, to raise your hand. There will also be time uh, tomorrow morning, I know, for some question and answer during the Sunday school hour. So um, I invite you also to bring comments or questions there. So here's the question to begin. When I say to you, prayer, when you hear that word, prayer, what is the image that comes to your mind, I wonder? Do you think, first of all, of uh, somebody kneeling at the bedside? Do you think, first of all, of the congregation gathered on a Sunday morning praying together? Do you think about a family around a table? Do you think about lighting candles? Do you think about, what do you think about 
right? What is, it that, what is the image that comes to your mind when you think of prayer? I want you to think about that for just a moment. And then I want you to think about, with that image in your mind, what is prayer? What is your own kind of working? If somebody asked you to explain what prayer is, where would you begin? This was the challenge that was put to me um, some years ago when I was invited um, to write this book on prayer. And to be honest, I thought, well, huh, I've never had to stop and do that before. So this was my, you know, this was my effort to do that. What is prayer? How do we begin thinking about what prayer is? So I'm going to invite you to think a little bit about that, and then based on that working definition of prayer, I'm going to ask you to think about what are some of the difficulties, right? What is the most difficult thing about prayer based on your definition of what prayer is? I'm going to give you just a minute. Um, if you're an introvert, you can think about this by yourself. If you're an extrovert and if you like talking to other people, you can turn to the person next to you. I'm just going to give you a minute, and then we're going to come back together, okay? What is prayer, and what is the most difficult thing about prayer? Okay, just uh, 15 more seconds. Keep on thinking. All right, I want you to carry that, write that down or carry that in your head, and I'm going to invite you in just a little bit to to chime in, but before we do that, I want to um, begin by listing some problems with prayer. Some of these may have been things that you identified. Um, the ones I'm going to name here begin with insights from a New Testament scholar named Oscar Kuhlmann, who wrote a really important book called Prayer in the New Testament. And um, he begins his book listing the problems of prayer. So here are some that he lists. Um, the one problem, um, are, these first ones are all about problems that emerge from the practice of praying itself. And so one big one is, how do we think about unheard prayers? Um, it seems as though people pray and God doesn't always respond. And so that feels like a genuine problem. It doesn't feel like you want to continue praying if there's not a response. In the book, I told the story about my older daughter, Miriam, who at the age of six announced that she didn't believe in God because she had tried praying and God didn't answer. Therefore, obviously God wasn't there. And um, so, you know, I think that that's a common, that's a common thing. You know, it got, doesn't always seem as though God answers prayers. Um, also, and this has certainly been uh, true for many of us in the past year and a half, um, it becomes difficult to pray in the face of terrible evil. I mean, when, when there is just such clear suffering in the world, so, you know, just huge scale of suffering, um, our own prayers seem irrelevant, right, seem uh, tiny in comparison to the suffering, evil uh, things going on in the world. 
Here's another one. Um, there's the, sometimes, for some of us, I think the challenge of thinking about how an all-powerful God could possibly be concerned with our petty needs. So this is kind of the flip side of that last one, right? Um, not, not thinking about big, massive things that need our prayers, but, but small things. Like, we could think, I would really like, um, you know, not to have to put on my mask for one more day. Uh, you know, and, and yet we might think to ourselves, that's a silly thing. That's a silly thing for God to be concerned about. How could God be concerned about my own petty needs? Or, on the other hand, uh, prayer can seem to be irrelevant if we think about God being omniscient, right? If God already knows everything, and in fact, Jesus himself in the Gospels says, God already knows uh, what you need before you ask it. Well, so that we might conclude, well, then what's the point, right? What, what's, what's the point of, of praying? If God already knows, then all I need to do is sit around and wait for God to act on what God already knows. Um, so there's that. Here's another one. Um, it can seem conceptually difficult to think about God responding to competing prayers. Here, you might think, for example, about competing football teams. I understand you all have a football team here. Um, so you might know something about this. You might know something about prayers on both sides of the football field. And it might seem to you at times that it actually is impossible for God to respond to both football teams, at least in the way that they're asking for, right? How, does, how do we handle that one? Or how about this one? Um, there are just the kind of practical, logistical challenges of uh, prayer that is... You know, it can feel like prayer just becomes a kind of empty routine habit. Uh, our hearts are not really in it. It's just repeating the words or repeating the gestures. Uh, that's a kind of a problem of prayer. Another kind of a problem of prayer is that we might feel as though we have no time to pray. Uh, our days are so busy. Our lives are so full. I can't add another thing to my planner. Um, the time it takes to pray can be a problem. Another one, perhaps, for some of us, might be that we, it can be a challenge to have the courage to pray. Maybe we have a sense deep down that there is something that we want to pray for, um, but we're afraid to name it. We're afraid to name what we really need. That's a different kind of a challenge of prayer. So this is a whole list of things. Let me list you some more, right? These are, all, these are all problems that might arise as we think about praying just from our own lived experience. Kuhlmann goes on, though, to list what he calls some more fundamental objections to prayer. This one. Um, the difficulty of praying to a god who is the creator of heaven and earth and also Emmanuel with us, God with us. Difficult uh, to believe in such a God and therefore difficult to pray to such a God. And some fundamental objections to all forms of prayer Immanuel Kant, those of you who have studied philosophy will remember that name, um, uh, late 18th century German philosopher who reinterpreted Christianity within the limits of reason alone. One of his treatises is known as Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. And for Kant, um, Christianity, religion was all very well as long as it was, as it was oriented toward ethical um, action. Right, um, and so for Kant, prayer, pardon me, prayer served no obvious or clear ethical purpose. It was instead a way of uh, rejecting our own moral responsibility, uh, because in Kant's view, prayer was trying to shift onto God the activity that we need to take on ourselves. Right. We're praying for God to solve the problems of the world rather than uh, trying ourselves to seek answers and to solve those problems. Even more uh, harshly, Friedrich Nietzsche, another German philosopher um, from the 19th century, 
objected even more strongly to prayer, saying that it's not just that um, prayer rejects moral responsibility, but it actually shows moral weakness. Nietzsche's view was that, um, that prayer puts us in a passive and weak position in relationship to the things that need to be done in the world, and therefore um, it doesn't empower us to do what needs to be done. Again, this is Nietzsche's view, and a reason that Nietzsche rejected the whole idea of praying uh, because it makes us weak and passive rather than strong and active um, agents in the world. Let me pause there and ask, what other things would you add, other problems with prayer? Before we talk about prayer, I thought it would be good to start with the problems, right? Uh, so what other problems did you identify when you were thinking about prayer? Or were there ones on that list that you specially resonated with? Yes, please. Listening. Oh, listening. The problem of listening, that's very, that's very thoughtful. Mm. Mm. Listening and concentrating. So the practice of actually uh, paying attention and listening and concentrating. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Surrender. Ooh, surrender. Say more about that. Mm. Turning your whole self over to God. That's a great observation. Surrender. Yeah, so what I hear in both of those comments is um, the, the challenge that emerges from the lived experience of praying, uh, the difficulty of listening and attending, the difficulty of turning oneself over. These are particularly hard, I think, in a culture that is so noisy and so busy and our schedules that are so full. Um, these are hard things. What other? Anything else? I'll take one more. Yes, please. Being superficial. Yes, good. So a problem that prayer can become simply superficial recitation of the words we know we're supposed to say. Yeah, that's good. Formulaic. Yeah, good. Good. Okay, excellent. So, so it's important to begin, right, by acknowledging that prayer is not simple or straightforward or it's not even obvious what it is that we're doing, I think. I, that's, I find that to be true. And, um, and that's why I think that my hunch about prayer is that most, most of the problems, or at least many of the problems that we face when we come to prayer, are theological problems. Um, they're not just technical problems. They're theological problems. And I think it comes from um, the problem that, in, in some cases, uh, God feels absent or distant. God doesn't feel particularly close. That's one source of some kinds of problems. Another problem can be that God feels wholly other. So maybe God exists, but doesn't seem to have any direct relationship to me. Or the flip side of that, God can be so absolutely intimate, so familiar that it feels like prayer is just talking to myself. Um, I think that much of the time, the challenge of Christian praying is to recover or nurture our faith in a God who is, at the same time, the creator of heaven and earth and Emmanuel, Jesus, with us, of us, and the breath of life, the spirit with us. I think this, uh, what you'll recognize what I'm saying here, the Trinitarian notion, faith in a Trinitarian God, in a triune God, I think begins at least to answer some of the challenges that we face when we think about Christian praying. And so for me, when I begin to think about prayer, um, I, when I was writing this book, I, I discovered that I needed to begin not with the what, but with the who. Rather than beginning by trying to figure out what prayer is, 
I realized I needed to begin by asking, well, who is involved? Who is involved in prayer? And particularly, first of all, who is the God to whom we pray? So this is the, this is the uh, question that we're going to be spending a little bit of time on with the rest of our time today. Who is the God to whom we pray? And to answer this question, I'm going to be focusing on this one little verse, which is um, the beginning of morning prayer for many Christians throughout the world, um, has been the beginning of morning prayer for many Christians since at least the fourth century. Um, St. Benedict, in his rule, uh, was one who, who used this prayer, and since that time, it has been common practice. Um, so this is the verse. It comes from Psalm 51, verse 12, 15, excuse me, 15. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. So I'm using this little verse as a kind of a, an entry point into thinking about who is this God to whom we pray? So in order to, to think with that then, I'm going to ask you, when you read that, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Where is God? Where is God in that little verse, that little prayer? I want to begin with um, just the first phrase of that verse, O oh Lord, open my lips. Now I'm going to turn this over to you. If you hear just that much, O oh Lord, open my lips. Where is God? Okay, I hear near me, proximate, and inside me. Okay, this is interesting. Two different answers already. So, um, so let me ask row eight. Uh, uh, what? Say more about that. Proximate. Where do you get the proximate? No. Good, good, good. Okay, excellent. So, so you get the image of the touching of the lips. Let me push on that just a nearness. nearness. Yeah, the, the nearness, right, the, the intimate touching of the lips. And we're going to come back. I haven't forgotten you. Um, so, so this is for anybody. What biblical narrative, if any, comes to your mind when you think about that idea of God being near enough to touch the lips? Maybe this one. What about this? What about creation? What about uh, the Genesis narrative? Or Psalm 104, where um, God is the one who creates, who literally breathes life into creation in a very intimate way, right? God is the one who enables us to breathe, enables us to speak at all. So we might say that that little verse, O Lord, open my lips, at one level is a reminder of what happens at creation, that God opens our lips in the very beginning. It is God's opening of our lips that enables us to pray at all. What about this one? Anybody remember Isaiah 6 offhand? This is the, this is the story of the prophet's call right? Um, Caroline will have remembered this from seminary, uh, popular among seminary students. Uh, so Isaiah 6 is the, is the story when uh, Isaiah has a vision of being in the heavenly throne room, right? And um, God invites uh, Isaiah to speak, and Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips, I can't speak, right? And what happens? Uh, in the vision, God sends a seraphim, I think it's a seraphim, um, uh, one of those crazy angels, um, to go and take a coal, a burning coal, and touches the lips of Isaiah, the lips of the prophet, um, and in so doing, purifies him, purifies his lips 
so that he can speak. Was it really? Cut it out. Like in church, you mean? Oh my goodness. Caroline, say more about that. What did you say? Oh, that's lovely. So, um, yeah, Isaiah says a lot of things, but does not tell us what God looks like. There's a, still a mystery. There's still a mystery there. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, so, so to me, when I hear this, uh, this petition, oh, Lord, open my lips, I think of both of those stories. I think of uh, the, the creation narrative and the opening of the lips at creation, and I think of the Isaiah narrative and the purifying of the words and the enabling of the prophet to speak. And then I also think, back to what you had said earlier, um, that God is also the one who is interior to us as the Spirit, praying in and through us. Here, thinking especially about that Romans 8 text that says that the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And so there is this, um, this sense, at least in Paul, that the Spirit is not external to us, so God is not external to us, but moves in and through us. So then, just in these few words, right, O oh Lord, open my lips, we can hear already God is at work in multiple ways, both um, opening our lips at creation and purifying our lips when we make mistakes, and also praying, breathing, moving in and through us, um, enabling us to pray in all of these ways. So, O oh Lord, open my lips. But that's not the end, right? There's the rest of that verse. Open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Okay, so God opens the lips, my mouth proclaims your praise, where then is God now in that part? Just, just visually, what do you, what do you think? If, if God has opened our lips and now God is receiving, sort of, right? At least that's... On a throne? That's, a, that's an image that we get often, Yeah. Yep, um, many scriptural passages describe God that way. This little verse doesn't necessarily give us a throne image specifically, but, but certainly we might go there. But Close enough to hear. Close enough to hear. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, right, within auditory range, <laughs> which we presume is, you know, pretty wide for God. But yeah, um, so, good. So God is somewhere near enough to hear us. And God is, in this case, the recipient. So this is one thing I think is interesting, is that whereas that first part of the verse emphasized how God opens, God is the agent, right? God is the one acting to open our lips, whether it's at creation or um, purification or, or moving in and through us. Here, God is receiving, God is the one who is the auditory recipient of our prayers. And importantly, the recipient of our praise. So God is not just neutral, but is good. So here we think about um, passages like Luke 11, which is that passage where Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray and says, you know, who of you, if your child asks for I think an egg would give him a snake or something like that, right? Um, it's that passage. And, uh, and goes on to say, so much more will God, who is your father, give good gifts to the children who ask. So um, here, the emphasis on praise uh, reminds us that the God who receives our prayers is benevolent, is good. 
So, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. We've already said a good bit about where God is. We've said that God is there at the beginning, opening our lips. We've said that God is within us, praying in and through us. And we've also said that God is receiving our prayer. So we might say that God is before us in two ways, right? God is before us as in prior to us and before us as in in front of us. And I see a hand. Yeah. Excellent. That's really lovely. Prayer as the first cry of the newborn. I love that. Yeah. And so if that is the image, uh, then is God the nurse? Yeah. God is the one who enables that cry and who watches. God is the mother. Yeah. God is the one who witnesses and who enables that prayer, that cry. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you for that. Do you all know there's a hymn um, in the hymnal called, I was there to hear your morning cry. Do you know that hymn? I'm sorry, that just came to my mind. Is it? Just file that away. Sorry, that was just a, the way my mind works. Sorry. Um, so I, I, I want to suggest one other place. And this one is not quite so obvious. Um, but as we think about this question about where is God in this little prayer, we've talked about um, o oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. I want you to think about this question. Who is praying this prayer? So let's imagine that you are praying this prayer. Let's imagine that, you are, that these are words that you're uttering, either by yourself or with a group. Are you the only one who's praying that prayer? Are you, are you praying that prayer all by yourself? I want to suggest that the answer to that question is no, at least not in a simple way. Um, that is to say, for one thing, when we pray a prayer like this, which is taken directly from the Psalms, we are already praying in the company of generations and centuries and millennia of people who have prayed to this prayer before. So we are already, in a sense, placing ourselves in the company of others simply by sharing the words. This is one thing I actually think is interesting about uh, praying prayers that we have inherited. Sometimes um, we think, oh, prayer has to be spontaneous. Prayer has to be uh, something that we generate ourselves that is new. But in fact, I think that there is some virtue to praying prayers that we have received over the generations because it shows us, yeah, hello, yes, uh, that we are not alone. I'll just pause here and ask, do we need to do anything to, okay, we're just, we're just going to carry on. Yeah, if we get hit by lightning, we'll just try to interpret what that's responding to. Um, okay, uh, so yes, I think that there is a virtue to praying inherited prayers like that because it uh, gives us words when we might not have the words, and it also reminds us that we do not, as Christians, ever pray alone. Even more profoundly, though, I want to suggest that when we're praying the Psalms, and, um, and I think, in a way, any time that we pray, we do so in the company of Jesus who is praying with us. This is an insight that I got, especially from reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who some of you may be familiar with, um, a German theologian who, um, yeah, a German theologian who uh, wrote back in the 30s and early 40s, um, who uh, famously was martyred in 1945 because he participated in a plot to assassinate Hitler um, that did not succeed obviously, and, uh, and he was executed 
days before Auschwitz was liberated. But um, earlier, in, a, in 1938, Bonhoeffer wrote a little book um, called Life Together, in which he talks about, um, among other things, the practice of praying the Psalms. And he says that when we Christians um, pray the Psalms, we occasionally at least become aware that, that when we are reading or reciting those words, there is someone else praying those through us, with us, that the word of God, Jesus, is enabling us to pray and is praying with us. It's a kind of a mind-bending, powerful observation, but I find it really helpful because it helps us to understand what it means um, for Christ to be the mediator of our prayers. Uh, Christ is the one who teaches us to pray, taught the disciples to pray, teaches us to pray, but, but it's not that Christ simply offers this lesson and then leaves the picture, right? Uh, in fact, what Christ is doing, even in teaching the disciples to pray, um, when Christ says, let's pray this, our Father, and that little word, our, at the beginning of that familiar prayer, gives us a clue that Jesus is not simply saying, you pray, and here's the script. It is, Jesus is saying, we pray, together. And I think this is a powerful reminder to us, therefore, that when we pray, we are praying not only with God before us, not only God before us in the sense of receiving our prayers, not only God within us, but God as Jesus Christ beside us, with us, our companion, so it's a powerful image, right, that we're beginning to, to I think, see here, uh, that, that prayer then is n not a simple relationship between ourselves over here and God somewhere over there or up there or even right here, um, that, that God is at work in multiple ways when we are engaging in prayer. I think what we're beginning to glimpse here is that prayer is a way of entering into participation in the triune life of God. So this is an insight that um, I find also um, in the work of Rowan Williams, and some of you may be familiar. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, now uh, back on the faculty at the University of Cambridge in England, a poet and a remarkable theologian. Um, and he, in one of his little books um, on Christian practices, he says this. Um, he says, first and most importantly, prayer is God's work in us. It is opening our minds and hearts and saying to the Father, here is your Son, praying in me through the Holy Spirit. Please listen to him, because I want him to be working, acting, and loving in me. I kind of love that, right? That, that, that what Williams is trying to help us to see is that when we pray, we're, we're not calling attention to ourselves. We're calling attention to this uh, relationship that's already there, precedes us. This relationship among the persons of the Trinity. And what we're doing is we're just trying to put a toe in. We're just trying to step in just a little bit to participate in that um, mysterious, loving communion of the Trinity. This is the way that I put it in the book. And this is the main image of prayer that I actually carry with me now. And that is prayer as participation in the triune God. So God, as I've been trying to say, is holy communion in God's own self. That is, we make a mistake if we think about God as just one monolithic thing or person, right? 
if we believe in God who is incarnate in Jesus Christ and who is active in the Holy Spirit, then we believe in a God who is dynamic, who is relational, who is communion. So in prayer, then, we enter into this communion as we acknowledge that God is at once the source of our prayer, the one to whom we pray, and our companion in prayer. And so when we turn to prayer, before we even open our lips, we are surrounded and suffused by the mystery of the Holy Trinity. That's you know, the one kind of thing that I discovered came to in the course of my own reflections on uh, praying. And I think that it helps a little bit to address some of the problems, some of the misunderstandings that we carry around with us sometimes. So I'm going to talk about just a few of those misunderstandings, and then I want to invite your questions and your insights Sometimes, when we um, think about praying, we can struggle with the idea that prayer is public performance. Every seminary student that I know of, including myself, has uh, wrestled with this because if you get asked to pray, I'm looking at Caroline, uh, if you get asked to pray in a seminary classroom, chances are nobody is going to raise their hand or the ones that do raise their hands, you don't want them to pray Um, because it feels like it's just a performance. It's a problem. Um, And so if we we get hung up on prayer as public performance, then we can fall into this trap that that Jesus points out in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, um, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. So it's a struggle. Of course, that can also paralyze us, right? That can keep us from praying at all. So, so how, do we, how do we move away from thinking about prayer as a public performance that we have to get right? Let me just pause there because I think if, if we go back to what I'm proposing in terms of thinking about prayer as participation in the triune God, then I think it can help us because it can help turn our attention away from um, our own words. It can turn our attention away from trying to impress other people. So even if we're praying with other people, if we think of ourselves as entering into the life of the triune God, then we reorient our attention away from ourselves and our own self-confidence or lack thereof, and we can try to focus our attention on God and on our stepping into that communion with God. Here's another common one, right? Prayer as a list of our demands. Prayer as the Christmas list, right? The list that we present to Santa or God, um, right? Uh, To say, and here's what I want and here's what I want, and here's what I would want, and here, would you just please fulfill this list, please. Um, Here, too, I think, if we reorient our understanding of prayer um, to thinking about prayer as a participation in the life of the triune God, it can help us to see the way that, yes, prayer for ourselves and prayer for others is a part of what we do, but that's not the only thing. It's not even the first thing that prayer is about. Prayer is, first of all, about being in a relationship, which is sometimes about listening and surrendering and sitting and being, and also sometimes about speaking about our needs. But not only that. Sometimes, and this is maybe particularly true in contemporary American culture, sometimes prayer gets presented as a really helpful form of stress reduction. Um, It's good for your health. And I think, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, although sometimes, depending on how we pray or what we're praying for, it could be actually pretty stressful um, because... If you, begin, if you begin becoming aware of the brokenness of the world and the needs of the world, that's not necessarily stress-reducing. It can actually be 
the opposite. But, but uh, if we think about prayer as stress reduction, I think the danger there is that we think about um, prayer as some kind of therapeutic regime that is about our health rather than about our relationship to the creator of heaven and earth. Or what about this? Perhaps you've heard this. Um, all of life is prayer. That seems right in, in one way. All of life is characterized by prayer. And yet my concern about this one is that if um, all of life is prayer, then the danger is that none of life may actually become prayer because we may just be, end up um, reinterpreting all of our errands and all of our anxieties and all of our tasks as prayer. I'll just call that prayer as a way of never actually setting aside the time to sit and to listen and to be and to speak. Or this. Some years ago, there was a whole series of books that came out that were um, popular that, that portrayed prayer as conversation with God. Some of you may, may have seen those. Um, and I think there's something really helpful and right about that. Uh, certainly, it is helpful to think about prayer as conversation with one who loves us in the same way that we would have conversation with our spouses or our partners or our children or our friends, so too uh, there is something right about thinking about prayer as conversation. There's give and take. There's listening and there's speaking in genuine conversation. My hesitation, though, about describing prayer as conversation is that it tends to portray God as simply the other person across the table from us. So we are here, God is here, and we're just having a conversation, which I think does not help us to see the, the richness, the fullness of what I've been trying to describe as prayer, which is also about God within us and beside us and before us and before us. I think that um, if we think about prayer as only conversation, it can actually backfire in making us think that therefore we have, to, we have to say the right things or we have to, on our own, independently, be a good conversation partner. But if we, if we also realize that God is at work in and through us and before us, it can actually, I think, empower us and enable us, remove some of the anxiety about getting the words right because God's already there already at work, prior to our even opening our lips. So instead, and this is just to reiterate, um, I think that what happens when we pray, at least what we hope happens when we pray, is that we enter into communion with God, who is at once the source of our prayer, the one to whom we pray, and our companion in prayer. And so the paradox then is this, that prayer is something that we do, and not alone. It is our action, and yet not our action by ourselves. When we pray, already, already, God is there at work. So that's where I want to end. And... Um, and I'm curious to know what you all think. What other, you may have had other insights or questions that you wanted to raise along the way or objections or um, things that you wanted to say. So now is a good time. Or you may have questions that have arisen as I've gone through. So what would you like to say? Yep, prayer is public performance. Mm hmm. Right. Right. 
So I heard you say that go in, that, that it's actually part of the same text, right? That Jesus says, go into your closet to pray. Yeah. And I heard you, I, I think I'm missing, I'm sorry, distance and mask. I think I'm missing the end of what you said. But I heard you say the importance of going into the closet, not praying in public. Yeah. Yeah. Going into your closet to pray. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. Could you all see that gesture? Um, uh huh. Take, yeah. So the gesture of receiving and then taking it into yourself, taking in God's blessing, God's response. Okay. Is that the way you? Okay. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. It could be. It could be. Yeah. I think it's, it's so helpful and interesting to pay attention to those kinds of gestures and bodily postures when we pray, right? What, what are we communicating? in our very bodies by the uh, gestures that we undertake uh, when we pray. That's a lovely one. Yeah, yeah. Another one um, that uh, maybe you all have read this or seen this, um, but um, in the ancient church, the posture of prayer for Christians, the posture of prayer was ordinarily something like this. There's actually a... There's a fresco in um, one of the catacombs in Rome that shows a figure in this posture. You can look it up on the internet. And, um, and some scholars, at least, uh, think that this was a gesture that signified um, resurrection. So that when we as Christians pray, one thing to think about is, might we think about praying head up, hands out, eyes open, right, as a gesture of, it's also receiving, and it's um, maybe submission and openness. I mean, like, okay, everybody just do this for a second, right? It's, it's interesting just to think about how that feels. What would it, it might feel a little weird, like, really, can I pray like this? Because, you know, we think about praying like this. Most of us, I'm guessing, most of us think, so, so just do that for a second, right? What's the difference between this and this. It's more it is very vulnerable, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, I'm gonna, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. It is a very open posture. Yeah. I mean, I think, not to say that this is wrong, but I think it's worth pondering sometimes as we, you know, as we think about prayer. It's worth pondering how our bodies are also involved. Prayer is not just like something that goes on in your head. It is something that uh, implicates your entire being. And so it's worth pondering, like, what difference would it make if I prayed like this? What difference would it make if I opened my eyes when I pray? Would that be distracting? Or might it enable me to enter into prayer in a different way? Yeah, thank you for raising that. Yes, please. Hmm. Wow. I mean, I think, so where does Thanksgiving come in? I mean, I'm not sure there's one right answer to that. I think um, it depends on, uh, you know, are you talking about individual prayer? Are you talking about corporate prayer? Are you talking about, um, I think that there are times, there are times, I think, that prayer emerges uh, in lament, right? 
and that, that needs, it needs to be okay um, for prayer sometimes to be a cry, right? Ah. Good. That's beautiful. Yes, I hear what you're saying. I do think that's an important reminder that um, if our default mode is always, prayer is always about, here's my list, always about asking for our needs, if that's the only thing, then it would be worth pondering how we might uh, shift gears and also name the things for which we're thankful. I've heard a lot more about this recently. I don't know if you have, but my daughter, my younger daughter, who's now in college, um, her, the, the um, president of the college where she goes, Smith College up in New England, has a gratitude practice. And she actually talked about this. Like the, the president of the college talked to the students about her practice of gratitude. Every day, she says, she practices gratitude. I'm like, really? I mean, that wasn't even a Christian, that wasn't even framed as a Christian thing. I don't know if she is or not, but I thought that's, that's a really important practice that I think, um, I think we do need to pay attention to. Yeah. What are the things for which we can be grateful? Yeah. Really? Ah. Yeah. Yeah. No. Sure. Sure. Oh, look, well, you just did it. Well done. <laughs> uh, but, but thank you for naming that. So, yeah, that, that, that the, pra- the prayer of confession felt um, like less, less common, less familiar in your own practice. Although I, I suspect you do in church, yeah. right? So you're, but you're thinking about in your own individual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's helpful. That's helpful. No, I, I thank you for naming that. Yeah. Um, I want to be attentive to time. I think we have maybe one more, if there's one more question or comment, um, I would be delighted. And I'm also happy to talk. I hope we'll be able to talk some more tomorrow morning as well. Yes, please. Ah, nice. It's, so the, I, the, the question I hear you asking, perhaps, is how do we think about to whom we are praying? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's another one that um, there's not a wrong answer, right? The, the, it's fine, I think. Uh, and, and different, um, I think at different times in our lives, uh, and certainly different Christian traditions uh, often will favor one of those over the other. Right? Um, I do think, again, I'll speak for myself, I do think it's helpful for me to think about the Holy Spirit as more um, the power that enables me to pray, right? Um, so the, the, the Spirit is less, uh, I think of the Spirit less as the one to whom I am praying and more the one in whom I am praying. And Jesus as the one in a way, to whom I'm speaking, but more with whom I'm speaking, right? Um, and ag- again, that's sort of getting away from the uh, um, being locked into the idea of prayer as conversation, but to realize that prayer is, is this activity that is not just this, but it's, right? It's more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's more this, <laughs> right? It's more involving. It's more participatory, yeah. 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 Well, it's a good question, I think. 
I want to be attentive to our time. Um, Caroline, I'm looking at you. Nope, I'm looking at Elizabeth, and um, I will look forward to perhaps seeing the rest of you again tomorrow, perhaps, I hope. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Morkish, for being with us today. As a reminder, we will gather tomorrow morning at 9.45 in Baird Hall. Baird um, Hall, and uh, that will be for a question and answer session before Dr. Morkish leads us in worship tomorrow. If you have not already signed up for that, the Sign Up Genius is in the weekly newsletter email for both the Sunday school hour and for worship. All right, thank you all for coming. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.